All right, so welcome everybody, day 12. Um, now, day 11, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, day 11 might be a prerequisite for most of these, so if you haven't seen it, you might wanna roll back to that one. The Especially the second hour of it. Day 11 was a monster two-hour session, and the first half was largely not the lean, but the second half was callbacks. Now, uh, on the actual post for day 11, and I don't know how far and you know how far away from the actual broadcast you'll see you see these um, just look for the actual archives I posted an actual script that does something uh, reciprocating animation so you can have a look at that it's also in the video description uh, I'd like the link to this post uh, I've added it to github for now but that's pretty volatile you know I might shuffle them many times so I will not recommend going to that. Uh, refer to the post, this is gonna stay up for a long time. Now, um, also history makes liars of us all. Um, I thought I said it with less certainty in the last stream that I was saying, yeah, I think the callbacks actually uh, is of 2017 do get stored with the scene, at least conditionally, but um, apparently I sounded pretty certain while I wasn't, and apparently that's also not true. Uh, so something else I was mentioning on the actual post is that eventually we might do a callback manager, um, which is not hard to do and it's definitely worth doing. So, but that's for another day. Now, the other thing regarding the past stream and possibly one before, um, I was I was using Charcoal Editor. Uh, if you don't know about it, uh, this is the website. It's uh, uh, Chris Zerbrig. Uh, hopefully I'm not butchering your name, Chris. It's uh, if you plan on doing any learning kind of development in Maya or, you know, relatively simple development, which the factory uh, script editor is just not particularly good for, uh, this is definitely worth a buy. The, I mean, the trial is pretty full featured, so give it a shot. Uh, I will recommend it. Now, with that out of the way, uh, well, and as usual on the website, you can find the resources there. So with that out of the way, Let's get on to today. So on on the last episode, uh, on the last episode, I basically set myself up for success a bit too much with the um, with the actual switching for the um, for the God node. So uh, by having everything word space related, I mean, obviously, if you transfer things around, you might want to compensate, but that's a different matter. By having uh, everything word related, basically there's no jump between spaces. I'm changing these if you can't see it. Uh, so, I mean, there's not really much space for callbacks and something like that. Uh, but apparently the actual callback part of, uh, uh, of last week was well received. So I thought we could do a little bit more with that. And looking at these, the, probably the next candidate to do something with auto switching, which is one of the uses for those, is the IKFK switch from the pedals. So right now, what we have is you know somewhat functional, very simple. Um, well, more than somewhat, it's actually pretty functional. Uh, very simple uh, switch uh, between not the pedals, the FKIK switch between FK and IK pedals. Now, one of the things that happens all the time with FKIK, even if animators swear to God some men that they won't ask for it, is that eventually they go like, oh, I really need them to auto switch. I'm doing these transition shots and it really needs to match everything for me frame to frame. It's actually not that hard to do, so it's not an unreasonable request as far as I'm concerned. It largely depends on the complexity of the component, but for anything like straight up, aim style uh, IK or you know two or three bone chains it's actually pretty easy to do now um, that also makes an argument for if we look at something like the pedals um, and this is a question that came up before how much of all of these uh, you know spaghetti graph um, would you collapse if we if we had compounds if we had proper compounds uh, you know, obviously these will get uh, compounded up, but how much of these collapse into, if we start writing nodes into an Uber node, um, that is entirely dependent on what you want to do pipe-wise. Um, Performance-wise, if this was something we had, you know, hundreds of, if it was, I don't know, um, a particularly tricky train rig for an effect shot where you need control over multiple wheels or something like that, 
Uh, Performance-wise, if you had dozens of these, you will definitely want to consider collapsing them into some Uber node. Uh, but when you have relatively simple stuff, it's not all that bad. I mean, this is not bad performance-wise. You're, you're gonna squeeze out a free chunk of work out of your CPUs with something like that. Um, the advantage of doing things, uh, this level of granularity is that when you need to expand or refactor, uh, it, usually, uh, it usually is a lot easier. So what we want to do, and sorry, actually, last thing about switches, there is two ways to do things. You will have on off switches. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious, you know, it's in one state or the other, and then you'll have blends. And as a TD, you really want to implement a blend usually. Uh, they're fancier, you know, you think, okay, if they're gonna transition over multiple frames, uh, then obviously you want to blend. Now blends obviously complicate matters a lot because you don't have that sharp transition between two states that you can monitor and react to. You actually have the potential for things to go one way or another. It's not just one state and the other state. Uh, suddenly every problem becomes about what direction are you traveling in when you have a blend? Uh, which way between zero and one are you going? If you're at zero five, are you coming from one and going to zero? Or are you coming from zero and going to one. So in those regards, it complicates things a fair bit. But as a technical exercise, it might still be worth doing. The funny thing, at least in my experience, is that animators usually end up not really liking blends, uh, at least for character animation. Almost everybody tends to, uh, when, they, when they do the blocking, they tend to go and work with uh, step curves and they will want sharp transitions over the frame. And when they start splining and they have tricky transitions, uh, normally they will be animating on once. So every every frame of the transition will be hand animated. So it turns out that most people will rather be mentally unencumbered than just go, okay, I'm switching and you manage the switch really well for me. Uh, and I don't care for a blend. I don't need to transition over many, many frames and have a, have sparse function curves, sparsely keyframe function curves. But that zero to one, that true to false kind of sharp switch needs to be perfect. So. With all of that out of the way, and your mileage may vary. I mean, uh, if you have an anim soup or an anim lead that you work with, you know, consult with them. If you're, own, if you're your own animator, if you really can animate for yourself, then, you know, have an argument with yourself and figure out what you want to do. Now, uh, the what I was saying about granularity basically means that if you look at what we have been doing, uh, what we have is we're going out to an output, which is going to be paying in this case. Uh, and all we are blending is a single rotation and we're doing it in this node. So going back to the, where was it? The pedals. Uh, if you look at the provenance of everything we're doing, it basically boils down to this, doing all of the work. The translation and scaling for now we decided are sort of irrelevant. Um, chat is finally populating luckily. So usual thing, you guys are my sounding board. Uh, if anything, it's details, let me know. So set yourself up for success when you do something like this, when you start implementing callbacks, uh, get everything that you think is relevant and establish the boundaries of what you want to do. So in this case, clearly what we want to do is uh, when an attribute, which is going to be located here, uh, root to, uh, sorry, FKIK switch is going to be changing, then what we want to do is depending on which direction it changes in, which is being a Boolean is irrelevant, it's gonna be stateless. Uh, you will want to either move these so that it matches uh, the FK, or if you're switching the other way around, what you will want to do is actually move these so that it matches the IK. So, and that is something, it's again, you know, interface first kind of things. Um, it's pretty easy just, and I do recommend whiteboarding stuff. So we know that if this was a function, we will basically have as an output, um, we have a condition, we always have one. We have one output that is always gonna be the SRT of the pedals. And that is conditionally gonna be uh, one of two. Nah, that's, don't wanna get too syntaxy. And that might be your FK or your IK control. But that is the only output we care about. Now, as far as inputs go, the only thing that we have is that switch itself. So what we need to do in here is make sure first, always make sure that you have everything you need. Now, callbacks are attached to something, right? It's what we've seen. So we are going to attach the callback to these, which means we're going to monitor it, which means uh, our input is going to be pretty explicit. 
Now, the next thing you want to do is from where you have that callback, make sure that you can actually retrieve these things. Now, as another facilitating thing, we are uh, already many ways doing that switch. We don't need to redo all of the calculation to get uh, these into word space and projecting it back and all of that. We have done that work in the graph up to, you know, sure it's it's live. So, you know, you're, you're only gonna be able to use whatever state it's in, but we are aiming for the state that we're going to and the callback um, gets us where we need to be uh, before the graph is evaluated. So that means that if we have something in the rig, sorry, just set. <coughs> If we have something in the rig that uh, represents like the end, uh, the end point of our calculations, at least in some local space, that is also interesting. So we let the rig do its work because it needs to do it anyway, and we care for that data. So what that means is that we also have a value in some local space that we want to look up. So what we are left with in here is basically just transforming that value from one space to the other. Um, and and basically that is from IK to FK. Now transforming that value, if you think about it, uh, because we're gonna manipulate the controls uh, somewhat directly means that we want to transform them. This is because, uh, because Maya works that way. Uh, we need to transform them into the local space, which means that as further, further inputs, we also need to know their buffers. Uh, because they're going to be in different spaces um, and you need to affect the local space. You will need to do some work coming from the word space. And that means that you also want the SRT buffer. Sorry, normally I keep my tablet at an angle. I'm really struggling here. Uh, the SRT buffer for the FK and the SRT buffer for the IK. So this is a bit theory-ish, I guess. Um, but I do suggest that whenever you start specking out a task, do a whiteboard. Don't, don't underestimate uh, how important it is to get your thoughts into something that you can look up and understand. If you cannot rationalize what you're trying to do uh, as a relatively simple graph, you might not have the full picture of the chain of consequences of what you want to do. So any questions like um, ask away, but I think this, this stuff is probably pretty self-explanatory. Now. Set yourself up for success means uh, know what you need, know your inputs, know your outputs, and, uh, and start working. Now, something else I suggest you do, always in terms of what do we need to do in here is, um, and even after like a fair few years of doing development, and at this point, I reckon knowing the Maya API, you know, respectably well, um, I still find that I do want a shopping list of what I'm gonna do very often. So when you look at something like that, what well, you need to be sure that you can do, that you know the API enough to do. Um, so if I was writing this just for myself, I would probably start writing it and be done in 20 minutes. Uh, but if you're new to some of these, uh, make sure that you know what you want to do, have your shopping list ready. So we definitely need to be able to get the word matrix of something and you will think it's straightforward and it's not. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna show you how to do that. Uh, so we know we want to get that. Uh, we want to get the switch. So that's just an attribute. If you can get something like the word matrix, there will be a triviality. Uh, we need to make sure that we connect our graph to do these things, which means we need to figure out the connections, which means you need to make sure that you know how to add and deal with messages. Um, and if you're doing these, uh, procedurally, which when you have a callback manager is what you will eventually be doing. Uh, that can get a little bit tricky with OM2, so it's worth learning for sure. And inside here, what you want to do is basically, it's mostly matrix multiplication, um, which we've done a lot of in the graph. So I'm sure the notion itself isn't anything uh, particularly new, but doing it inside the API is a few caveats. And the other thing you want to do, because we have a single rotation angle, is making sure that we can deal with uh, Euler angles and Euler rotations. Well, Euler rotations in this case, which are, made of, which are made of angles. So again, hopefully all of these make sense. So we'll work for the shopping list because some of these might not be super trivial. All right, for the set yourself up for success kind of thing, uh, we see messages and they don't affect the graph. We know we're going to work off these. Uh, and messages are pretty good for a number of reasons. Um, 
to keep track of things. And one of them is that they can output to something without doing uh, any damage of any sort. Now, if you look at something like the pedals SRT buffering example, and you normally cannot connect to things like this. Uh, and the message that you get in Maya is output only. So that's a problem. We need to figure that out. We need to sort that out. That's actually pretty trivial, but um, foot for thought. You want to make sure that you can also input to your messages. Now, uh, to that effect, and I actually need to check this. Hopefully I'm not lying, but we'll check right away. When you add an attribute through the UI, uh, this is all you get, uh, which is pretty slim. That's slim pickings here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that Maya can do, like add matrix attributes, which are super convenient, as well as uh, attributes as arrays and so on, which is just not exposed in the UI. I'm not sure why. I mean, that's that's a super old UI at this point. Uh, Maya can do a good deal more than that. What you want for that is, and normally I'd rather do OM2, but uh, showing all of the uh, functors for the attributes and all of that might be overkill. It's literally just the add actor command. And I love how this is the Python command. And then you actually get uh, quite a bunch of mail stuff. Let me see. The example is, no, the example in this case is Python. When you look up these, like you look at Python commands, very often you'll find the examples are actually mail. Um, so these might be super small for uh, you guys to see because of the resolution and the down resting. But uh, what you want to do is basically, hopefully the text here is bigger, is basically that and nothing, uh, nothing more, nothing else. Uh, add adder, the type of adder you want. Uh, this being mail will take all of these in stride and the name that you want to give the attribute. So going back to these, we say we want to add the uh, FK buffer. Uh, this is going to be a matrix I've, I've written I've written SRT, but obviously we want the matrices for these, the one for the IK, and we will uh, want to get those in word matrix form. So let's see, you sh we should be able to add. So FK buffer matrix, and that should get us what we want. So when you add, sorry, <coughs> When you add uh, messages like these, you actually get them uh, as I.O. So messages are full pass through. You can do pretty much whatever you want going through the messages. No, like information is, except for some rare cases, it's not really going to travel across. But if you want to start connecting things and sort of sort out your own metagraph to operate on, especially with tools, uh, they work pretty well. So we say that we also want the IK buffer matrix. Again, messages have no, no bearing on the graph. Um, so yeah, but you know, you, you can go, you can go to town with this one and add whatever you want. These are all the parameters that we want to use. Uh, the switch we have on the node itself, the rotation is going to be uh, coming from this attribute. Now, here's the other thing you can do. Uh, have a look at what is going on with the stuff you're doing, like, is this affecting this node? In this case it is. So you probably don't want to grab the output of these and pump it straight back into the settings to move it along. Uh, not a great idea. But if you did not have these dependencies, if this was something that was uh, a sibling with no, uh, with no receiving effect to the settings, feel free to also grab interesting attributes and just pump them into your settings or into some other node somewhere and collate the information that you need before you uh, before you start working. So uh, I don't think we're going to get the lot done not while talking about it and explaining the uh, caveats with OM2 and how to work around them in one day. But hopefully we are going to set ourselves up to do some work. And yeah, now the last one we probably want to add in those regards for now at least is the rotation. And again, because we this node depends on this one, uh, we can't really do it um, as just grabbing the value and passing it through. We'll have to use a message to monitor that value. Chances are we only want the one angle that we were working with. Um, if we were allowing more degrees of freedom than we do, we could want to use more, but not for now. So that's gonna be 
land of rotation. Uh, careful with your names. I mean, there's no telling what names are reserved by Maya sometimes. So uh, feel feel free to be verbose. And make sure that you don't uh, you don't try and steal something from Maya, which will sometimes rarely. I think most of those bikes have been squashed, but sometimes you can call something like an attribute that Maya expects from some tool to create itself, and then you get some horrible things happening. Uh, Maya conflates tools and operations in the graph a lot, so you you know make make them yours. Now, uh, again, hopefully makes sense up to here. So, going a little bit, oh, sorry going a little bit uh, OM2 with this. If you are not familiar with Maya's APIs, uh, there's basically three of them. You have commands, uh, OM1, which is a bit of a disgrace, at least in Python, OM1 and OM2. OM2 is what we're gonna use. Uh, and it's basically the manually made bindings to the C++ API. Uh, there's also PyML, but PyML wraps a number of other things and tries to make a lot more Pythonic. Some people like it. Um, it's syntactically clear for a lot of people, but um, actually I can use this. Uh, I personally am not a huge fan of it. I don't, but I, I know the C++ API well enough that I actually like uh, the fact that OM2 is not Pythonic at all. I don't think Python being Pythonic is a great attribute for an API. So yeah, someone in chat that has worked with me is saying OM2 for life. Yeah, you know it. So, uh, I think we've done a fair bit of this, so I don't need to comment on every single line. I have the documentation open on my other monitor, but I will show some of the relevant documentation. Now, we did have, this is the stuff that I posted for the other week, by the way. Uh, we did have some stuff uh, that we should very well reuse. If you're using a full-blown e, um, IDE, then you can uh, you can have your own snippets, but otherwise keep files around, get stuff in full working order. Uh, I'm not gonna go into programming itself. Like, uh, you know, if you have things isolated to functions that are fairly self-contained, um, resist the temptation to object oriented everything and get yourself some useful functions while you're learning. We're not talking about developing full-fledged tools for a pipeline. While you're learning, have useful snippets and do a lot of composition real quick to do what you need to do. Now, uh, oops, uh, what we want to do here, let me resize these. Again, bears repeating, like this is a charcoal editor, it's pretty awesome if you're doing learning-like work. Uh, the Maya script editor is like just so painful for this kind of stuff. Um, uh, set yourself up for success is something I keep saying. Means you know have something, know what you want to do, test it first. Don't you know? Don't don't do things you don't need to do. Don't do the lot right away. Test every small bit on its own. So same as we've done before, we can go for each M object. Well, let's do it Pythonically, I guess name wise. So for each M object in either selection, oh, come on, I can do it. Then we want to do something. So uh, here's something you probably want to know about OM2 right away, which is you have an object and I'm not gonna go into detail. Uh, and that is pretty much everything well, mostly everything in Maya scene actually comes down to, MM, to an M object, which I suspect under the hood is mostly a dressed up and type pointer in memory somewhere. And that's a table of contents everything in scene has. And if you come from XSI, that can be a bit puzzling because you can't do much with M object other than knowing they go somewhere and that they will tell you what type uh, of functors they can have attached to them. The other important part in OM2 is basically using the functors. And as we'll get to C++, I'll explain more of these and all of it ports to OM2 in Python. Uh, but what those are is basically when you find things like this. Uh, OM2.mfn dependency node, it wants to be initialized with something. And then you will also find OM2. I'm probably explaining uh, MFN dag node probably explaining more OM2 than I wanted to, but uh, this is definitely gonna take a couple of streams at this point. Now, what these are, uh, they're basically functors, they're set. Uh, MFN is for, uh, I don't know if it's Maya functions or Maya functors. Um, there's some jokes around that acronym, but I don't want to go into those uh, on stream. Uh, 
Um, what these do is basically you have a pointer in memory somewhere that represents that object and if you think about it depending on what it is whether it's you know if it's a shape and it's a curve it can be operated on as a curve um, if it's a transform it can be operate it can be operated on as a transform if it's a uh, uh, not one of those if it's a dg kind of node obviously you cannot attach transfer functionalities to it and so on and on and this might seem confusing at first uh, personally i don't mind this choice um, the api in my end this might be because uh, because of, uh, the developers being foresightful or it might be because of the age it basically forsook uh, wide and odd inheritances and stuff like that and went for a very very simple straight up only usually only one deep inheritance uh, and it lets you attach functionalities to objects pretty easily now bit of a a bit of a lot of stuff in there but what this means is that when you look at the documentation you can usually and obviously i pick something like the mfn dependency node which might show a more intimidating inheritance diagram that you want to deal with but uh, MFN dependency node is just saying, okay, this is a node in Maya and it can be operated on the way every node can, which is doing things like setting its name uh, or querying its name, querying its namespace and so on. Then there's a bunch of sub functors that basically inherit from that, depending on what you want to work on. So if you're working on a function curve, then you know, you're gonna, you're gonna use this, you're gonna use the MFN anim curve and so on. Now, the other one you are gonna be interested in, is going to be MFN DAG node. Now, I'm a big fan of using the narrowest possible functor you can use because it validates things a fair bit. So MFN dependency node will attach to practically everything. Uh, it's meant to, uh, well, everything that is a node. It won't attach to attributes which are also an M object uh, or rather instance an M object under the hood. Um, so MFN DAG node is a lot narrower then MFN dependency node. I could find the matrix with my MFN dependency node just fine um, if that thing was actually transferring, but it would fail uh, if that thing was in a transform. So I like narrow functors, so I will do something like that. Now that's going to be my functor. Um, call your variables, whatever you want, and I'm going to start preaching on what I do with mine. Uh, and you want to find the word matrix for that. And that is where things can get a little bit tricky. So from um, and the whole thing about like big spiel about um, the inheritance of those functors is that something like find plug you if you look at just MFN DAG you will not find mention I believe of find plug in here so it's important that you know how the actual inheritance scheme works because you can always find plugs on any uh, on any node in the graph this might be minuscule for you guys but anyway uh, take my word on it in this list uh, that's me in this list, there is no fine plug. However, MFN DAG inherits from MFN dependency node, and in here you do have fine plug. Uh, again, I think I mentioned these. The whoa, all right, that's interesting. I mentioned these the last stream. Uh, very often, you will have to jump to the C documentation because the the OM21 for Python is it seems to be derivative. It seems to be automated, and it doesn't give you a library clear picture of all the signatures. So what we want to do is get the word matrix for that. And that's gonna be our word matrix plug. Now, if you do something like that, you know, you can do the, uh, actually, let me show something. I have something that's a DG node selected. That should vary, yeah. Um, well, actually, no, I'm also forgetting to run a function here. So set, oh, this might be a DAG node after all. Um, I need to give it false, uh, which means no networked. Yeah, of course, I'm showing the DAG only. So if I run something like this, it would tell me uh, object does not exist. Um, this is correct. I selected something that is not a DAG node, therefore this functor will refuse to attach to that. If I select something that is a DAG node, this will actually work. So find plug, find the word matrix. Man, I'm, I'm really, I'm really running long with this introduction, but hopefully it's useful for you guys. Uh, again, let me know if it's not and we'll, uh, we'll correct our course a little bit. Now, this is going to be an array plug, uh, which means that, uh, let's find something that is not too messy, which means that the array plug itself 
which I can't even click apparently, is pretty useless, especially for something like the word matrix. Uh, some of these factory plugs in Maya are very particular and you have to learn how they work. Uh, find a way to wrap the way you want to work with them semantically and be pretty careful with it. Uh, but once you know the caveats, they're pretty much like anything else and OM2 is pretty fast. You gotta give that to the people that do the bindings. Uh, some bugs here and there, but they're very well engineered in general. Now, to find the plug that we can actually read that has some value, we want to get the first element in the array. Um, normally, you might want to evaluate the element count or stuff like that. Um, okay, sorry, I was following chat for a sec. Uh, normally, you want to evo the element count or something like that if it's your own arrays. But for the factory ones, you can pretty much rely on these existing. Again, this is stuff that is specific, Maya domains. And you, you learn to navigate it as you practice. So, long to write, fast to execute. I, yeah, OM2 isn't that long to write. Uh, I find that by the time you're done, like once you, use, if you use commands or pymo and stuff like that, your first iteration of the script might look pretty nice and condensed and all of that. But the moment you try and get yourself a wrapper, it becomes an absolute nightmare. Um, OM2 is pretty easy. Whoa, all right, that might've been very loud for you guys. Uh, OM2 is actually pretty easy to turn into good domains and good functions. Anyway, enough preaching. So what we want to get is a sub plug of this. So this is an M plug, which means that you can do, uh, I think it's element by, I never remember if it's by right? element by logical index or physical index. In the case of these uh, factory stuff, they should always exist. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, run every line, make sure you don't make mistakes. Uh, I still do that even if I know um, if I know in and out what I'm actually doing. So sub plug I use for compounds usually. So this is an element plug and it should be the first in that array. Uh, again, you know, make sure you know what you're doing. And this is the part that gets interesting. Maybe when you get used to it. Then... Yeah, like anything, once you get used to it, um, you know, it might, it might be better. And it depends on what style you choose for. I'm not, look, I'm not ragging on Pymel. I don't use it, I don't like it. It doesn't mean it's bad. I know a lot of people love it. Um, you know, different folks, different strokes, different priorities. If you want to wrap the guts of Maya, which is what I like to do, um, OM2 is just superior. If you want something that feels very Pythonic and you're writing at a very surface level, then, and you don't particularly care about performance because you're doing, you know, run one stuff on the farm, it's like, go to town with it, whatever works for you. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're in production, you need to deliver. So that gets us the array plug itself. And this is where it gets a bit funky. Um, so if you look at the documentation for M plug, now when you have the M plug, you can normally get, um, and I think I was mentioning this the last time, you can get its value um, for, um, for most types, if this was C++ because of operator, because of yeah, type-based operator overloading, you would only get the value and it would just get you whatever whatever it is. It knows its type because this is pipe and it doesn't quite know what it is. So you have to ask it for the thing exactly as you need it. And that's a matrix and you might notice that there's no uh, as matrix. So in theory, and the way you will do this in some other situations uh, will be you get your element plug and you will be able to get it as an M data handle. And I'm, I'm basically showing you something here that doesn't work because that's how a lot of people start it. Um, so that should get me the handle for the plug. And a lot of people get it wrong and they think it's them. And it's actually just uh, matrix parts can be a little bit funky in Maya when you use them in Python. So in theory, once you have a data handle that is literally Maya, um, I'm not going to discuss the nodes too much right now. There will, there will be a better context to do it when we do nodes, but there is there is a data block uh, inside of each node that Maya basically passes around, and that's how the compute internally works, or rather, what the compute uses. And you have hand, handles on the boundaries of that, uh, which is very functional. It's very much like the interface first kind of stuff we've been talking about in so far. Um, but it gets a bit funky and I don't know why for something like this. Uh, there's also like float matrices and double matrices and you'll find sometimes some work one way and the other doesn't and vice versa, which is extremely confusing. So again, 
you need to mature a little bit of software dexterity. You need to know how Maya likes to be gently stroked in these regards. And eventually, once you know it, you'll be fine. So once you have a handle, uh, then you should be able to just get whatever that contains, if you know the type, like that. And that should actually work, but if you... Uh, invalid syntax, because I'm probably an idiot. Yep, might want an equal sign there. So if you do something like that, you, you'll see a bunch of really weird numbers coming out. So that's um, for whatever I have selected. And let's pick something that actually has interesting values. So we would expect something, yeah, the IKFK should do. So if you look at something like that, you will not expect these values. Now, if you don't know this notation, when you see E minus 311, this basically means that it's uh, raised to a very high negative exponent, which means this is just precision drift. This is, this is rubbish. These are extremely small numbers, like uh, quadrillions of, of a single number. Quick question on plug arrays. Do you always need to evaluate num elements and understand the side effects of not doing with you? Uh... So, mm, okay, if you're using your own array plugs, the question is, do you always need to use evaluate num elements? So if you're iterating an array plug, there's something uh, in this case for something like that, which is, uh, ev is it evaluate or eval num elements? But anyway, so if you're inside the node, uh, you will not use this. This is only safe outside of nodes. And that basically tells you how many plugs there are in that array plug. If you are messing with the graph, if there's, if there's a series of changes in value in what you're doing and the uh, that actual array attribute can change in size or it's, it's handle specifically, it has an array data builder and so on, Yes, you very, very much want to get its count with that evaluate call because it will force it to become aware of its contents and its length, and it's a lot safer. Uh, if you're using, like if you've already done it once, you don't need to constantly redo it unless you have significantly altered that attribute in some way. Um, you can always not do it and pray that it works out if you have very clear expectations and it's your own nodes and you know exactly what's going to come out. Um, of each of them, very often you can forego it, but it has practically no cost. So if you're using something like the factory and all you want, like factory arrays, and all you want is to get the value of that, and these, these are very fake arrays for the record, then don't bother, you don't need it. We just, it's, it's artificial in array. So hopefully that makes sense. More digressions, but this has basically become, more than callbacks, it's become, I guess, uh, my LM2, so pretty useful, I reckon, so we'll do that. Now, we're getting garbage numbers, and they, I, I have honestly no idea why that's the case. I will fully expect this to work. In fact, I will fully expect to be able to just do um, handle plug dot uh, as matrix, you know, something like that. Uh, but what you get is the same garbage. So in some other cases, what am I doing? Ah, so I'm doing the same thing. Uh, sorry, what I meant is... Um, Uh, I will fully expect this to exist, but it doesn't. So you can deal with the plug directly. Now, in some other situations, you can just get data handle, uh, get the handle and ask for its data and you'll be fine. In this specific case, which we use a lot, and that's why I'm going for all of this pain, uh, you can do it. So don't ask me why, secrets of Maya, whatever, but there's a way around it. So instead of getting the handle, what you want to get is the actual M object for the instance of that attribute. Uh, and that is straight off the plug. So that should be the M object for the attribute we want. Should be just the plug it, come on. The plug itself as an M object tended to say. Yeah, and that basically gives you the attribute itself. Now, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting. After you get the attribute itself, uh, you can get a functor that only deals with matrix data. So is this overcomplicated? Yes, uh, don't be fooled, don't fall for the trap of like, oh, more text means it's slower. No, this is actually pretty fast. It's considerably faster than anything you can do in any of the other Python options. I can promise you that it's pretty well tested. So you will go MFN matrix data. Again, this is very specific. 
uh, Maya knowledge, but if you want to work with matrices, which is what something we're doing a lot, uh, you need to know, it. I'm sorry. Now, that data is finally, this, this is a functor. So this is saying, okay, there is, a mob, there is an M object, uh, which is pointer and RAM somewhere. I know, I trust that that is actually attached to something that is of a matrix type and that it actually has matrix type of data in it. I just want that damn value. Please me, please give me that damn value. So you attach a functor that says inspect matrix data, give it an address in RAM, which is what the M object is under the hood, I reckon. And finally, you can get your matrix. If I remember right, now it'd be like super funny if this was not correct. Uh, no, that's also wrong. Sorry, this is you. That's a so yeah. The syntax can change ever so slightly. I need something selected, obviously. There you go. So that is actually how you get the bloody matrix in Maya. And as you can see, the values here. Hopefully, yeah, the text should be large enough. Uh, the values here make sense. Uh, you look at that, it's, you know, this is the matrix stuff we're talking about. The X axis is rented on the X word, the Y axis is uh, on the um, Y of the word and so on. So, boy, this took a long time, but it's pretty important that you know how to do this. So with that knowledge under your belt, the next thing you want to do is given an M object, uh, just a bit convoluted, it isn't because I'm explaining, it's just something that you need to know. Well, all APIs have their peculiarities when they grow these old and large. Um, personally, all I care for an API is that it's as consistent as possible and as fast as possible without crashing. So I can cope with this. It's not one of my favorites, but it's pretty reasonable. So if I want to get matrix data out of an object, um, do we want to shorten it? Yeah, I reckon so. If I want to get a word matrix from an M object, then what I want as an argument itself is the M object. And we've been doing all the work here. So to, 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 we can practically just reuse this. This is exactly what this function is. So that node for the M object. Then we find the plug for the word matrix, we find first element, we get the attribute as an M object, and you can shorten all of these, and then we just return MFN matrix. You might hear a baby crying in the background. That's my daughter. That's that time of the day, one of the six or seven times of the day. And that's pretty much what we need to do, I reckon. So. Let's try it super quick. All right, that seems to be working fine. So we are now at the point where we can, I wanted to get more than one object. What am I doing here? Really? Okay, I just unlucky drag. So there you go. We can now inspect uh, pretty much everything we want. We can get the matrices. Very good. Now, next step that we mentioned we will need to do. So we now can get matrices, we now can get the rotation. Uh, we want to make sure that from any given node, uh, and by the way, any callback, you can run as a script first, and then once you're happy with that script and that you're running manually, just turn it into a callback. That's a uh, much easier way to deal with things. Now the... Mm -mm -mm. Sorry, there's a couple of things in... So there's um, questions relating to what I guess is the code install. No, I don't like try accept uh, in first place. So the question was like, no try accept on find plug. Uh, not if I do something like this. So A, I don't like try accept as a control flow, like as a flow control mechanism. Uh, for me, if something accepts uh, or try accepts, it's like the failure needs to be handled. Like A, it needs to be exceptional. It's called an exception. Uh, when you use exceptions as a you know routinely employed method of uh, flow control, it's not good. Um, if I really wanted this to be safe, um, I like to write unsafe stuff. If I wanted this to be safe, um, I would say this one, maybe you know this one we could care about, and that's pretty easy to do. So you go um, uh, if not mob dot 
this is more API stuff, but I guess it's useful. Okay, uh, I know. And it could go. So basically, every M object, I was saying, eh, actually, this is worth discussing, I guess. Every M object only knows two things. He knows that it's pointing to something somewhere in a table, uh, probably a, you know, a memory address under the hood or a pointer to a hash table, it doesn't matter. But it just knows there's something over there. Uh, and the other thing it needs to know to be able to attach functionality to it is the type of that object. So something you can do without needing any functor very, very quickly is uh, has a fan M object. Uh, if you look up the API as this, um, has a fan is basically going to tell you, can this object receive a function set of this type? And you have kdag node, you have, you know, k container, whatever, depending. This is the fastest way to check for type, believe it or not, even if it's off a long exclusion list, to check for the type of a node. So if I were to set something like this, you know, I will get a bunch of errors. Uh, well, I'll get a bunch of prints because I'm not erroring and it will return none. So that's worth checking so that this one doesn't fail if people have a wonky selection. Uh, as far as accepting the find plug as well, no, I will never do that. Uh, well, I've done it in APIs in wrappers, but I would only do it in non-performance critical parts and it's normally to test for some things. Uh, the word matrix is always gonna exist on a DAG node. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm okay with it erroring because it means it's either a very special node or something went fairly wrong. So I would want it to error. If I really wanted to protect this, I would certainly not uh, enclose it in a try except. What I would do is probably something like MFN DAG uh, has attribute. And at that point, you could probably like forego these, use an MFN dependency node and go word matrix, you know. Um, so if not, that then again return none uh, and i mean in this case we'll error of that selection in this case it will always work let's say that instead of word matrix uh we you know we use some other attribute there you go it will fail uh, okay seems that these uh i think that these answered everything now if i know it's a factory plug I don't do this. Uh, but now you know how to do it. If you're doing something that might or might not exist, work off the minimal amount of stuff you can do. So if you already have a functor, uh, use as attribute. This is ridiculously fast to check. Try accept in Python, like trying something, if it always succeeds, is actually pretty cheap. The problem is when you use it as a flow control, constantly accepting is actually really, really slow. Uh, and in C++, I just, don't like exceptions. I don't think they're a great idea. I don't think they work particularly well. Uh, I am glad that uh, my as an API decide not to go with exceptions. So uh, this is becoming instead of callbacks, it's becoming an OM2 uh, stream, but hopefully that's useful enough. Uh, I don't mind doing this stuff. Hopefully you guys don't mind watching it. Now, um, let's get back to the master plan. So we now know how to get the word matrix. Uh, we have added messages. Uh, we know how to add them, sure. Do we know how to do matrix mode? No, not yet. Uh, do we know how to get Euler rotations? No, not yet. So let's have a look at that. Um, what we want is to find a bunch of things. Well, we want to add a few of these. Uh, and finally, so FK buffer matrix. So word matrix. Is this, yeah, this is the FK. I think we have not prefixed the FK and we have prefixed the IK. Probably not what I would normally do, but I mean, this is a small enough rig that we can still have a decent handle on what we're doing. Um, now, the funky thing about this is that we are actually not super interested in uh, what these things are doing value wise because we want to set them to something that comes from somewhere else. Now that somewhere else is actually this node. So we don't really care about knowing these controls. We just know that we want to output to those. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll do it. But the part that we do care a lot about is that blended rotation. And I think that we were using yeah, the DA. So this should be, oh, come on. Have I, no, I've not made that bubble. 
because some time ago I did not have the sync on and that was funny that was pretty funny for everybody else not for me um, so yeah this is a DA which means it's a uh, double angular uh, so it's a single value which means we don't have to isolate a specific one and that is our blended rotation I don't think that when you just connect messages like these you actually get any cycles uh, and I might have did I misconnect something so that's a K which is cool I might have like misconnected something because I just got so this is the FK one yeah. I feel like I'm am I misconnecting something so that control is not connected which is good this is is it me or is it just magically disconnecting my stuff nope not that please yeah no it wasn't I must have been doing something stupid time to save yeah sure we can save this one thank you uh, most most of the work we're doing was in here so if anything um, Actually, the other thing is, I think charcoal, I'd, I don't want to lie again, so I'm going to say I think, I suspect that charcoal actually saves the buffers fairly often. I've lost buffers to Maya. I remember charcoal getting me my buffers back from a couple crashes, so if that is the case, that alone is worth the price as far as I'm concerned. Um, I do have a couple things on the other screen exactly for these kind of things, which is... Uh, I always use multiple text editors, uh, like I use uh, Notepad++ as a kind of just a pasteboard and I use charcoal if I need to do something in Maya and I use Visual Studio or if you've seen this, this is PyCharm, uh, depending on the language I'm writing in, uh, when I need to do actual, you know, considerable amounts of work. Now this is not super great because uh, because of the stream to keep the text size you know something that will be able to be read uh, it's not exactly how to do it it's like it's low density but yeah so those are the applications I use and that is how I shuttle my text back and forth now uh, matrix multiplication can get interesting here and a lot of it is uh, predicated on what type of matrices you have so in Maya you have three types of matrices and you have the doubles uh, which is just M matrix and you have floats which is M float matrix and you have the transforms, which actually wrap up a lot of stuff, but it's so-called an amateur transformation matrix. Um, we're going to look at rotations first, which are pretty easy. So from these, let's say that we have a single angle and we actually, because we will be working with M transformation matrix, we want to get um, a full rotation from it to do some magic with it. Uh, and because we want to go out to free attributes for whatever reason, um, you know, it's, it's not what we actually need, but it's like just, just doing the one angle doesn't seem right because uh, it's a bit too specific to our case, not going to teach you a lot. So the other thing we want to do is, um, you know, what do we call it? Um, get M raw from output uh, given an M object. Sure. So we want to get a full M Euler rotation which is a triplet of angles out of a node that we know has an output that is of type angle. It's a bit specific, normally I will uh, probably, if this was anywhere, this will get underscore, double underscore, and just be for internal use to break code down. Uh, but for the time being, so we'll go, we don't know what type of node it might be, and um, we're very likely to encounter, you know, just non-dag nodes, uh, full dependency nodes, so we're gonna use uh, MFN dependency node and um, this is what we were saying before actually where I was going okay we don't know for a given are, are we willing to bet that this is going to be used the right way or do we want to check that there is something called output so in this case um, I will be willing to bet that there is, I guess, but let's do it. So we actually have some code somewhere that is, um, that exemplifies everything, but it's dragging long. I guess tomorrow we're actually gonna get to the, uh, to the callbacks proper, uh, but this is kind of required knowledge to get to it. Again, chat, I'm relying on you to tell me if this makes sense. So, uh, do do do, and then that dot has attribute, it should be lowercase. There's the thing with Maya nice names, which not a huge fan of. I've actually rewritten chunks of the UI for this kind of work for myself, but I can't cheat and use that. Because uh, a lot of times you see the nice name, uh, but 
yeah when you actually do anything with it and you can see it usually you will see the real value so it's saying disconnect output so it's lowercase and when you get into attribute aliasing this can get pretty brutal so uh, if it has an output uh, then we want to get its value so there should be tempted to say as a mango actually exists some plugs uh, pretty positive it does yeah, as a mango, so that should get you the radiance right away, uh, and it should get you an actual M angle type. Uh, when you get the M angle, you can do a bunch of things with it. So if you look up the M angle itself, it's it's basically this. Is actually, I like uh, it's part of the API that I think they did well, like the way it handles units. Uh, it might feel cumbersome, but it's correct, and I like things that are correct. Um, so it's it's literally just representing the angle. It's literally representing the angular effort to go from A to B, uh, which is proper. And then you can choose to get it in different units as you want. Now, um, man, I'm going on a lot of tangents in this one. So if that is true, what you want to get is the angle equals, well, first we want to find the plug. So we'll go mfn dot find plug output uh, false we don't care whether it's networked or not it would always I mean you could choose to go yeah it's it has to be network otherwise this is not valid but that gets very very specific to the callback we wish to implement so there, there are things that you can de-escalate or re-escalate later on uh, so we will go plug equals that angles equals plug dot so as an angle then for something like this like sadly this is uh i mean for, for what you pay charcoal is pretty good but the auto completion doesn't do uh particularly far deep uh assumptions so for something like that if you start writing a lot of text so something like that having the right inspection in a a full-blown IDE, which is going to set you back a lot more than 60 bucks, uh, might be pretty useful. Uh, anyway, so let's say, and this is another point in doing things uh, by functions instead of complex objects, it takes very little time to test these things. So you can go print, get a um, rot from output. Oh, come on. So, in this case, we return angle. If you don't know, Python always returns. So, if I don't need to go, okay, in here I return an angle, otherwise I return none. You will need to do something like this in a lot of other languages. Python will always return none from everything that is not returning something else. So, there you go. And that's the other thing of like using M angles. They're um, probably the wrapper in Python or the string method is actually wrapped so that it tells you what unit you're in. Um, and I think you could do, if you wanted a float, not that I will use it, but yeah, you will get the float in degrees right away. All right, that's still all making sense. Hopefully it is. Now we say that we actually want an M rotation. So there is another object in Maya that you're interested in for this. I clearly did not plan this really well when I titled it callbacks because it's actually become intro to transforms in OM2. So emular rotation is an actual emular rotation. It's, I'm still on the fence whether I like it or not as an object, but you need it often. And it look, it does what it says on the team, right? Uh, so it will take X, Y, Z, and it will take an order because there can be a Euler rotation without having the order. So in this case, we have actually predicated a rig and some fixed rotation orders um, because we want minimal angles and least influence angle and all that crap uh, we know that it's xyz and even if uh, even if it wasn't we know we're only affecting the x so we don't care for that but you do care to have a triplet so uh, the actual rotation for these will be equals uh, on two maybe emulum rotation and this is the part where in this case it's actually not that bad the doco uh, it tells you look it can take a vector in the order it can take a sequence in the order it can take a triplet of values in the order 
Very often when you have multiple constructors, not every open Maya docker page is that well constructed. You will have to go to the C++ one and look at what constructors you have available. So uh, we're going to say we do care about the X. Uh, I'm wondering if it will take an actual, I bet you it will not take an M angle, but we'll see. No, I don't bet you actually, who knows? So we only care for the X rotation uh, and the there should be a default for this, hopefully. Uh, but if you want to look at the statics, you will know what the various types of order rotation order are by looking at these. And these are just static functions that you can get from Euler rotation. So if you wanted to give it a value uh, under the hood, that would be an integer. So you either shortcut it with integer or you will do emulate rotation dot k x y z that is just literally just going to pass you an integer if you printed these you will get an integer that's all it is uh, it's important to know these and where in dub to use the actual application constants because there are some oddities like if you look at rotations in the transformation matrix they're actually off by one compared to the emulate rotation ones so hopefully that also makes sense let's see if that works yeah that actually, well, no, it's not working because it's not working on that. Uh, no matching constructor found. Yeah, it doesn't like angle. I think it actually likes radians. So 0 0.86. Um, I've only watched up to the point. Sure, this will make all sense on swap. Yeah. Um, I guess in a way this is kind of getting standalone. -y. It's becoming an intro to writing OM2 code for Maya, but yeah, it probably will make more sense um, once you catch up to the second half of the previous episode, which was 11. So now this is our rotation. This is basically in you know XYZ Euler form the output of these. Now still got a few minutes. Uh, if you have questions, start thinking of them and start posting them in chat because I reckon in about 10 minutes I'm going to wrap these up and take questions and if there are none or right after I'm done answering them, shut this down uh, and we'll come back to these later. But uh, what we want to do last but not least, uh, we could always return an empty Euler rotation for the record. So if this doesn't exist, then uh, we could... Let's do it. Let's actually do things the right way, I guess. So I could set angle here to be 0, 0.0, and this is not necessarily what you want to do all the time. Um, but if I didn't want things to fail, if I always wanted a zero rotation coming out of this function because I'm chaining it, I'm writing pseudo functional, uh, you could just do something like this and it would always return a valid rotation whether that's a good thing or not it depends on what you want out of the function or how you use it if you want to find whether it could do its thing or not then you will definitely want to return none if you always wanted a rotation uh, which when this applies is going to be a useful one then you will do it this way uh, actually this will fail because i'm using angle as radians so i will need to do and actually we can probably test that if i do this yeah it's stuck a flow as no object as radians attribute object as radians so what we we'll need to do is and this is the part that you know turns a lot of people off uh, when it comes to om2 i know these feels verbose and overwrote and all of that um this is the way a lot of c plus plus works uh and it's actually not all that bad so way that out of the way now the other thing that we want to do is, okay, let's say that we, instead of going each mob in each selection, we're gonna find this value and we're gonna find the, we're finally getting there. We're gonna find the word rotation of whatever we're doing, right? Um, hmm. Sorry, I'm just thinking for a second here. Yeah, we can probably use the word space with that. So if I do, it's this is just for the sake of example anyway, it's not like we're trying to achieve functionality right away. But if I look at something like this, then the pedal IK is a T buffer will be there. Our control is slightly off. So did I, uh, yeah, of course it is. I actually moved it around. So yeah. Mm -mm. 
let's say that we're just just for the sake of showing how the multiplication itself works we'll, we'll get to actually use all of these things tomorrow um we want to find this rotation which we know to be local to the staves and we want to find it in word space so that then we can transpose like well not quite transpose it um we can then uh we can then take it to another space uh, to transition between the two controls we're going to use two any dummy matrices in this case so uh, for the sake of testing you know um, we can do something like that and this is an iterator so we could do we could actually get each selection as list um, pretty trivially so any any iterator like this you can in Python, you can straight up convert to a list or a tuple. Um, in this case, I don't want to modify the contents. I like immutables. Like if I promise something is immutable, I make the type immutable whenever I can. So, so in this case, if the length of our, let's actually be correct. Otherwise it gets confusing, I guess. So if the length of that is greater than two, then we should be able to go, and we trust the order of selection. Um, otherwise, we're gonna start adding a lot of logic and this is just for the sake of testing. Then what we want to do is we say in the first one as matrix. Uh, so we go word matrix, we called it. Yep, I have it line below, I can't do that. So let's get the word matrix from the first item in the tuple and we want to get the uh, rotation in a Mueller form from the second one. So function object is not iterable, of course it's not. I need to actually call it. Uh, not getting anything interesting here. Why am I not getting in? Ah, yeah, that's wrong. There you go. So that gets me the matrix for this, the rotation for that. Now the other thing we're interested in, and normally, like I know in previous streams, I've actually said learn to do these things um piecewise without relying on uh on massive api objects to do their work for you but at the same time you also need to know how those massive api objects actually work for when you want them uh so and i've shown how to do the individual bits so we might as well show how the massive objects work so you have m transformation matrix and you can initialize one from an m matrix and what this is is if you go back to the math lessons you know you, you remember we said oh the matrix is uh gonna be something what in this case uh something like this you know and you can extend it to have more and more items and you basically describe transformations uh in higher dimensionalities now in transformation matrix does not do the row elements and transformation matrix can come from a number of uh let's call them user-friendly elements i guess uh where it literally keeps track of the transform entire so it will tell you oh, that the rotation in euler form is this rotation in quaternion form is this the translation is this whereas if you had the row matrix uh, to know what the translation is, you would have to uh, extract the numbers yourselves. So that is actually pretty convenient if you're in a hurry or if you need to do complex enough operations to do something. Okay, I have a rotation, it's in some local space here, I want to find it in some word space uh, elsewhere. How do I do that? How could, can I transfer these multiple things? Now, there should be something where you can go rotate by so doo -doo -doo, adds a transformation rotation component which is basically take a matrix and add whatever rotation you need now in this case i'm tempted to say we could probably add that rotation straight away so this this matrix we have is gonna take 
yeah, it's gonna take us to the that that depends on implementation. So I need to look it. But I think that the matrix we have for the word but uh, for the word matrix is gonna take us there. And then whatever is added from this node, uh, which is local to something under that space, and we're not accounting for translation all of that, should actually get us a reasonable value. Now, please prepare your questions if you have any, because this is probably, well, without probably, this is gonna be the last thing I do on stream for now. So we want an M transformation matrix instead of this, which is, Uh, obtainable from another matrix and this is let's just say that it's uh, I really hate like I sketch names bother me uh, okay I'll catch up to the questions after these I like that first question we got so now that I have that I should be able to do SRT W matrix dot uh, is it add rotation we said? Rotate by, sorry. Am I doing the right thing here? M transformation matrix, so this is correct. Um, should be right. Rotate by and it will take a quaternion and a Euler rotation. The space should be optional. So this is probably just auto completion, not quite getting uh, far down the inheritance chain. And we should be able to use this straight away. So running, it runs. Uh, do, well, it will probably skip. I don't think I had the right selection. So, okay, line 36 function takes two arguments, one given. So this actually wants the M space and the M space we want to give it in this case. Uh, we can probably give it object. It doesn't really matter. This is what I was saying before. This is just variables. Uh, in this case, we're actually deriving a lot of stuff ourselves. So what we're getting for the rotation here um, or for uh, the matrix here, it's we're not tracking what type of space it's in. So uh, word and object should be equivalent. Let's go for K word. Let's go for... Uh, so you can just give it that or you could go if you want to be good and proper uh, and space dot k word so that should work now in theory if i print this is probably too rich of an object so i don't expect anything meaningful from the print yeah it's just telling you this is an api object of this type but going back to it you should have as matrix here and last time i tried this actually works so let's see how it works and you can do things like get the inverse right away get a rotate matrix this is very like this this is a very rich uh, object and it's very very similar to a lot of stuff that you get oops sorry straight one to one out of uh, an node like this a diagonal like that which is the part that makes it convenient and abused if I have to be honest um, learn to do the basic operations before you use this so now there you go that actually looks not too bad so if I don't do the rotate by, let's actually check for that. Um, what am I doing here? Okay. So this is the matrix before we get the rotation and this is the matrix after we add the rotation. And we should be getting a considerable enough difference. So the first one, you'll see that it's rotated. Yeah, this is pretty good. What do you know? We actually managed. Um, this is the first, this is the x-axis, uh, this is the y-axis, this is the z-axis, and so on. And if you look at what we had here, uh, the way this thing has been rotated, this is by pure coincidence, uh, it looks pretty correct. So before transforming anything, the matrix we're actually looking at is this one. Uh, if you look at it, the z has not been moved off the word, and so you get you know, that corresponds, that looks good. Uh, the X has taken, uh, has taken some pitch, so it should have a positive Y, it definitely should have a positive X, uh, but it shouldn't have anything on the Z because it's not being rotated around the Y, uh, so there's no offset there. So that looks good and so on and on. Now, once we actually add what the uh, blend node is brought in, which is on that axis, you will see that it sends the law uh, slightly off kilter. And actually, yeah, that's, that's probably the equivalent of this. So does this look? 
yeah, it looks fairly similar. So you could just basically print this one and compare them. Um, yeah, it looks like we got where we want to be. Um, done nothing for callbacks, uh, but we've gone through, you know, design and the shopping list and all of that. We now have all the elements we need and we know how to get them and it's taken an ungodly amount of time to write 40 lines of code but hopefully you know the explanations on the way help you know what you're doing here and do a little bit of that too so it seems legit yeah it seems legit to me too i think it's like if you really want to and this is why i think you know do like learn to break things into useful functions uh because it means that you can very easily do things like this and verify your data very, very quickly. So let's say that, let's complicate things just a tiny bit. I know I say it, I would have done otherwise, but uh, so let's say we have three items selected because I suspect that all consider this is basically what we're doing with the Transformers wave. So if we take the IK buffer and we take that rotation, so this is one, this is two, and then we take the word matrix for this. So I have a third item in the selection. I would say that these I expect to be the buffer position. After it's been multiplied by that, I would expect it to be there, which seems legit, seems to where it should be. Now you can either just straight up get that pedals word matrix and print it out and hope that it's the same of that or if you want to be saucy you could actually take it invert it and multiply it by what we have and make sure that the result is an id matrix so it's, you should have just it should have just offset itself um sake of time let's actually do something simple so i'm so tempted to actually do it the right way i gotta resist that urge so we have that they should be straight up good so now we're off by some major we'll have to look at what the so the translation is correct if you look at it uh no it's not now we have a little bit of work to do i've, I've just haphazardly multiplied some stuff together but uh clearly we're doing things slightly different that's uh that's for the word matrix for tuple two yeah we'll look at it so it's only one question in so far that hasn't been answered yet which is a question building components from scripts do you use open Maya for building components chaining transforms together etc or do you mix some commands in there at that point um that's probably a you know fairly long discussion to have I've actually given presentations uh certainly internally at work and in some other uh some other sites as well about the whole om2 versus commands versus so on one and so on so i am actually commands in maya are not bad i don't like pymill and om1 is a disgrace uh it's objectively bad um i don't mind commands and i don't mind om2 now uh, we'll eventually get into that, but OM2 has one issue, or rather something that you need to carefully manage, which is it doesn't do anything for the undo for you unless you manage it. So if I was doing more than querying here, if I was modifying things, OM2 does not put any undo chunks in your history, which means that if it's creating nodes and then you undo, and if you're creating nodes with OM2 and then you undo, uh, those nodes are still there, which, you know, it's arguably sim pollution but it's not super bad where it gets really bad is if you do something like uh you've run a command that creates a node say this one and then you run om2 to delete that command uh, then you run the undo the undo will actually undo because you haven't chunked the om2 work you've done the undo will actually try to delete a node that you've the undo of the command before that om2 run will try to delete the node that you had already deleted. So that's gonna get you in trouble. So commands, if they query, and if that query is fast, I actually use quite a few of them. Like anytime you need to do something like selections, uh, they're super useful because I suspect they have some shortcuts to the internal hash tables or something like that. Uh, they're measurably, they're measurably faster than a lot of stuff 
that you can do elsewhere, sometimes even faster than what you get out of C++, which to me suggests there might be some shortcuts. So I'll give you an example. Uh, something I don't mind in example is uh, object exists. If you need to find whether something exists or not, uh, doing it with OM2 can be fairly painful. Uh, iterators in Maya, like, I don't know when the last time the word change was, but they're not as bad these days, but they're still very, very C-like. So they're cumbersome. Uh, they can be fast in some cases. They can sharply drop in some others. If you just want to know if an object by this name exists, I'll do it with a command. And that happens all the time if you, well, I might actually want to also import the module. That happens all the time, right? If you save your own file formats and you want to recreate things and you want to know if something exists before you create it, so, you know, maybe maybe you're doing progressive additions to your build. Um, this is fine. This query is the scene. It doesn't put anything on the stack that if you put OM2 stuff after it, you know, it will interfere with. Uh, if you use them to create something, uh, you got to be careful. You got to start being very, very careful with how you manage the undo. So the long story short is I tend to use commands only and exclusively in query mode. And when they're faster than anything else, I use OM2 for everything else. If you're pre Maya 2016, you're going to have a tough time with OM2. Um, a lot of stuff got added to it over 2016, 2016 and a half, uh, which was, I don't remember what the naming convention is anyway, 2016.5 and 2017. Before 2016, you're, you're going to be in dire straits in some cases. Hopefully that answers it um, extensively enough. Now, if there is nothing else, I reckon I keep streaming, like keep announcing streams that are uh, supposed to be something and do something completely different and then I get to what I wanted to do the following one. So yeah, someone is saying, agree, we still use 2015 at work, it's a pain. Yeah, 2015 was not a release I loved. Um, I'm, to be honest, I mean, I'm not a fan of any application in particular, I'm not partial to anything. I'd say 2016 was the first release of Maya that impressed me in a while. At least it was the first one that had a jump considerable enough with the whole parallel evaluation and the GPU, the former stack, where you go, okay, this this is really worth updating to. It's a, it's a generational jump. And the fact that for a couple of release cycles, they also took OM2 a little bit more seriously and extended it, uh, that's a big bonus. There's, there's a massive difference in performance across the board between something like Maya 2017 and Maya 20, uh, 2015. Anyway, enough advertising for Autodesk. They're not paying me for these. Uh, I've given enough props, I reckon, for these <laughs> for these episodes. If there is nothing else in the next like 10, 15 seconds, whatever the stream delay is, I am going to shut this down. 12.30 sharp. First time in a while we're actually on time. All right. Just a quick check of my aversion for me, no stable feature balance. 2016.5. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I guess the shortened question will be, you know, what's the most stable and features balanced version? I will say it depends on what you do. Um, 2017 update four. Uh, so I, I also have a bit of an issue here. It's like we do a lot of testing at work. So some of my findings are at home. Some of them are at work. I got to be careful because I cannot cross the two. 2017 update four for the way I personally work is pretty good. Uh, well, to, sorry, I should say update three because I've barely done anything with update four. Uh, <laughs> ridiculously late. Hey, man. So some, somebody joined the stream in literally the last minute of it. Um, 2016.5 was okay. Uh, it bothered me that it changed the ABI. Um, 2016, like raw 2016, no updates, no anything, a little bit sketchy. 
But I'd say 2017 update 3 is, uh, it's not been bad at all. Do bear in mind though, it's like, uh, for me, I, I'm fairly peculiar and narrow-minded when it comes to what features I use and where and stuff like that. So I, I tend to hit a few selected areas. Those I tend to hit very, very damn hard. But there's a lot of stuff I just don't use, so it might be an absolute disaster for you. I I don't know. It's it's been good to me. Um, and other than the first few days, which I suspect were partly because of uh, like the stream is on twenty seventeen update three, and I'll probably move to four soon enough. Um, other than the first streams where I think that my personal compile of um, OBS and FFmpeg was interfering. Um, on stream it's been fine, but we we've been rigging unicycle, so that's not exactly stressing it. Now, it doesn't depend on the situation as much as on what you do with it. I can I can give you my experience, and it's most of it is on Linux. You know, it's um, well, yeah. I guess it depends on the situation. It depends on the context. It depends on your deployment, on what you do with it, uh, and how pervasively it's used across you know the facility. Because I I only I I go a long stretch from uh, from you know the the stretch of assets all the way to the end of the animation pipeline and stuff like that. Uh, I have practically zero visibility over issues like rendering or shading. Uh, I don't do any of it at, um, at home. Uh, at work, we use a proprietary rendering engine and the pipeline is like pretty far removed. So yeah, for rigging, for work from home, I will say get 2017. It's 2017, whatever update you have access to. It's a, uh, it's a good release for work from home. It's a great release to learn on uh, compared to the previous ones. It makes, you know, a lot of stuff bearable that was pretty broken before. All right, I am going to call it. I think I have belabored the whole version thing enough as well as the whole OM2 thing enough. So no callbacks. I keep lying unintentionally, but enough OM2 that I think we now have all the fundamental bits that we'll need to use to put together a callback to do the switching. So thanks everybody for watching and we are closing this one here and I will see you stream guys and gals tomorrow and everybody else I won't see you because you're on YouTube, you're not on the stream. Bye.